Hi friends, different day, same shirt. That's because I slept here in the classroom last night. It was so quiet and so peaceful. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I made two videos in a day and maybe I will make a third. It is so much quieter here in the classroom and here at the school than it is in my own house. <laughs> All right, kiddos. Oh. Before I read to you today, I wanted to share something with you that I thought you might find interesting. This is kind of the fun thing to be back in the classroom as I have all these objects I'd hope to share with you. And uh, now I have a chance. Okay, so in this box here, I have something really special. We've been reading about a silkworm and how the silkworm was helping um, helping create string for the to, for the hooks to catch the seagulls. Well, I actually have a silkworm cocoon here. Now, a silkworm is a caterpillar, but then the caterpillar weaves a special cocoon that is actually made of silk. Silk is a material that you make very expensive and beautiful clothing with, and you could actually make clothing if you boiled enough of these cocoons. Now, after the silkworm is done eating and eating, and they eat a lot, silkworms eat uh, the leaves of a mulberry tree. And unfortunately, I don't have a mulberry tree. And I don't know what one looks like, even if I did have some silkworms. So I haven't ordered silkworms in a long time. But one time, when I had a teaching friend who did have a mulberry tree in her backyard, she ordered some and we went through the life cycle from the caterpillar to the uh, to the cocoon and finally to the last stage of it's like a moth not a very pretty moth but it sure makes a beautiful cocoon and I have this in the classroom so I wanted to share it with you this is what the silkworm cocoon looks like I'm going to show you the inside too that is the way that the silkworm I didn't pull I didn't pull the um, the little moth out. The moth came out on its own. But this cocoon could actually be boiled, but you need a lot of them, and then um, and then turned into silk string, which to me is remarkable. Who figured that out? It was figured out a long time ago in China. I hope you found that interesting. I always thought silkworms were quite interesting. All right, well, let's carry on. So when we left off last, they saw a ship. Did you think they were going to be rescued by the ship? Let's find out. I don't like it, the captain said. Nor do I, said the first officer. Do you think it's following us, said the second officer? I tell you, I don't like it, muttered the captain. It could be dangerous, the first officer said. That's it, cried the captain. It's a secret weapon. Holy cats, send a message to the queen at once. The country must be warned and give me my telescope. What would you think if you saw a giant peach floating in the sky? I would be very suspicious too, I've got to be honest. There's birds everywhere, he cried. The whole sky is teeming with birds. And what in the world are they doing? And wait, wait a second. There are people on it. I can see them moving. There's a, do I have this thing focused right? It looks like a little boy in shorts. Yes, I can distinctly see a little boy in short trousers standing up there. And there's a, a, a sort of giant ladybug. Now, wait a minute, Captain, the first officer said. And a colossal green grasshopper. Captain, the first art officer said sharply. Captain, please. And a mammoth spider. Oh dear, he's been at the whiskey again, whispered the second officer. And an enormous, a simply enormous centipede, screamed the captain. Call the ship's doctor, the first officer said. Our captain is not well. A moment later, the great round ball disappeared into the cloud, and the people on the ship never saw it again. Oh, I thought that was their chance. Chapter 24. But up on the peach itself, everyone was still happy and excited. I wonder where we'll finish this time, the earthworm said. Who cares, they answered. Seagulls always go back to land sooner or later. Up and up they went, high above the highest clouds, the peach swaying gently from side to side as it floated along. Wouldn't this be a perfect time for a little music, the ladybug asked. How about it, old grasshopper? 
With pleasure, dear lady, the old green grasshopper answered, bowing from the waist. Oh, hooray, he's going to play for us, they cried. And immediately the whole company sat themselves down in a circle around old green musician, and the concert began. From the moment that the first note was struck, the audience became completely spellbound. And as for James, he had never heard such beautiful music as this. In the garden, at home on summer evenings, he had listened many times to the sound of the grasshoppers chirping in the grass, and he had always liked the noise that they made. Do you like the noise that... Often I don't see grasshoppers, but crickets. Do you like that noise? I like the noise, until there's one trapped in the house, which happens every summer, and I can't find it. It's just chirping and chirping right next to me. Then I don't like it quite as well. But this was a different kind of noise altogether. This was real music, chords, harmonies, tunes, and all the rest of it. And what a wonderful instrument the old green grasshopper was playing on. It was like a violin. It was almost exactly as if he were playing on a violin. The bow of the violin, the part that moved, was his back leg. The strings of the violin, the part that made the sound, was the edge of his wing. He was using only the top of his back leg, the thigh, and he was stroking this up and down the edge of his wing with incredible skill. Sometimes slowly, sometimes fast, but always with the same easy flowing action. It was precisely the way a clever violinist would have used his bow, and the music came pouring out and filled the whole blue sky around them with magical melodies. When the first part was finished and everyone clapped madly, Miss Spider stood up and shouted, Bravo! Bravo! Give us some more! Did you like that, James? The old green grasshopper asked, smiling at the small boy. Oh, I loved it, James answered. It was beautiful. It was though you had a real violin in your hands. A real violin, the old green grasshopper cried. Good heavens, I like that. My dear boy, I am a real violin. It's part of my own body. But do all grasshoppers play their music on violins the same way that you do? James asked him. No, he answered, not at all. If you want to know, I happen to be a short-horned grasshopper. I have two short feelers coming out of my head. And we shorthorns are the only ones who play our music in the violin style, using a bow. My longhorned relatives, the one who have long curvy, feeler, long curvy feelers coming out of their heads, make their music simply by rubbing the edges of their two top wings together. They are not violinists. They are wing rubbers. Wing rubbers like the cicada I showed you earlier. And a rather inferior noise these wing rubbers produce. If I may say so, it sounds more like a banjo than a fiddle. How fascinating this all is, cried James, and to think that up until now I had never even wondered how a grasshopper had made its sounds. My dear young fellow, the old green grasshopper said gently, there are a whole lot of things in this world of ours that you haven't started wondering about yet. For example, do you th where do you think I keep my ears? Where do you think the grasshopper keeps his ears? Let's find out. Your ears? Why, on your head, of course. Everyone burst out laughing. I guess he doesn't keep them on his head. Let's find out where he keeps them. You mean you don't even know that, cried the centipede? <laughs> Try again, said the old green grasshopper, smiling at James. You can't possibly keep them anywhere else. Oh, can't I? Well, I give up. Where do you keep them? Right here, the old green grasshopper said, one on each side of my tummy. It's not true. Of course it's true. What's so peculiar about that? You ought to see where my cousins, the crickets and the katydids, keep theirs. Where do they keep them? In their legs. One in each front leg, just below the knee. Isn't that odd? Makes me so curious about where other insects keep their ears. You mean you didn't know that either, the centipede said scornfully? You're joking, James said. Nobody could possibly have ears in his legs. Why not? Because that's ridiculous. That's why. You know what I think is ridiculous, the centipede said, grinning away as usual. I don't mean to be rude, but I think it's ridiculous to have ears on the side of one's head. It certainly looks ridiculous. You ought to take a peek in the mirror sometime and see for yourself. <laughs> Pest, cried the earthworm. Why must you always be so rude and rambunctious to everyone? You ought to apologize to James at once. Chapter 25 James didn't want the earthworm and the centipede to get into another argument, so he said quickly to the earthworm, 
Tell me, do you play any kind of music? No, but I do other things, some of which are really quite extraordinary, the earthworm said, brightening. Such as what, asked James? Well, the earthworm said, next time you stand in a field or a garden, look around you. Then just remember this. Every grain of soil upon the surface of the land, every tiny little bit of soil you can see, has actually passed through the body of an earthworm during the last few years. Isn't that wonderful? It's not possible, said James. My dear boy, it's a fact. You mean you actually swallow soil? They do. Like mad, the earthworm said proudly, in one end, in one end and out the other. But what's the point? What do you mean, what's the point? Why do you do it? We do it for the farmers. It makes the soil nice and light and crumbly, so things will grow well in it. If you really want to know, the farmers couldn't do it without us. We are essential. We are vital. So it's only natural the farmer should love us. He loves us even more, I believe, than he loves the ladybug. The ladybug, said James, turning to look at her. Do they love you too? I'm told that they do. The ladybug answered modestly and blushing all over. In fact, I understand that in some places, farmers love us so much that they go out and buy live ladybugs by the sackful, and they take them home and they set them free in their fields. They are very pleased when they have a lot of ladybugs in their fields. But why, James asked. Do you remember when I told you about this? Or maybe you already knew. I bet you already knew. What do ladybugs eat? That's right, aphids. Because we gobble up all the nasty little insects that are gobbling up the farmer's crops. It helps enormously, and we ourselves don't charge a penny for our services. I think you're wonderful, James told her. Can I ask one special question? Please do. Well, is it really true that I can tell how old a ladybug is by counting her spots? Have you ever heard that? Oh no, that's just a children's story, the ladybug said. We never change our spots. Some of us, of course, are born more spots than others, but we never change them. The number of spots that a ladybug has is simply a way of showing which branch of the family she belongs to. I, for example, you can see for yourself, am a nine-spotted ladybug. I'm very lucky. It's a fine thing to be. Here's what she looks like. Does she have nine spots? I see four. She must have a fifth below on the other side? I don't know. Hmm. <clears throat> Here we go. On the other hand, the ladybug went on, some of my less fortunate relatives have more, no more than two spots altogether on the shells. Can you imagine that? They are called two-spotted ladybugs and are very common and ill-mannered, I regret to say. And then, of course, you have the five-spotted ladybugs as well. They're much nicer than the two-spotted ones, although, my, although I myself find them a trifle too saucy for my taste. <laughs> but are all of them loved, said James? Yes, the ladybug answered quietly. They are all of them loved. It seems almost everyone around here is loved, said James. How nice is this? Do you remember which, which of the creatures is not as much loved? I bet you do. Not me, cried the centipede happily. I'm a pest and proud of it. Oh, I am such a shockingly dreadful pest. Hear, hear, the earthworm said. But what about you, Miss Spider, asked James. Are you also much loved in the world? Friends, do spiders do good things in the world? They certainly do. But are they loved? Hmm. Alas, no, Miss Spider answered, sighing long and loud. I am not loved at all. And yet I do nothing but good. All day long I catch flies and mosquitoes in my webs. I'm a decent person. I know you are, said James. It's very unfair the way we speed spiders are treated, Miss Spider went on. Why, only last week your own horrible Aunt Sponge flushed my poor dear father down the plug hole in the bathtub. Oh, how awful, cried James. I watched the whole thing from a corner in the ceiling, Miss Spider murmured. It was ghastly. We never saw him again. A large tear rolled down her cheek and fell with a splash on the floor. But is it not very unlucky to kill a spider, James inquired, looking around at the others? Of course it's unlucky to kill a spider, shouted the centipede. It's about the most unlucky thing anyone can do. Look what happened to Aunt Sponge after she did that. Bump. We all felt it, didn't we, as the peach went over her? What a lovely bump that must have been for you, Miss Spider. <laughs> it was very satisfactory, Miss Spider answered. Will you sing us a song about it, please? So the centipede did.
<laughs> oh, the centipede has a way with words. It's not complimentary. Aunt Sponge was terrifically fat and tremendously flabby at that. Her tummy and waist were as soggy as paste. It was worse in the place where she sat. So she said, I must make myself flat. I must make myself sleek as a cat. I shall do without dinner to make myself thinner. But along came the peach, oh, the beautiful peach, and made her far thinner than that. That was very nice, Aunt Sp uh, Miss Spider said. <laughs> now sing one about Aunt Spiker. With pleasure, the centipede answered, grinning. Aunt Spiker was thin as a wire and as dry as a bone, only drier. She was so long and thin, if you carried her in, you could use her for poking a fire. <laughs> I must do something quickly, she frowned. I want fat. I want pound upon pound. I must eat lots and lots of marshmallows and chocks till I start bulging out all around. Ah, yes, she announced. I have sworn that I'll alter my figure by dawn, cried the peach with a snigger. I'll alter your figure, figure, and ironed her out on the lawn. Well, he did, uh, the peach did alter her figure. It changed it, that's for sure. Oh, centipede. Everyone clapped and called out for more songs from the centipede, who at once launched into his favorite song of all. Once upon a time when pigs were swine and monkeys chewed tobacco and hens took snuff to make themselves tough and the ducks said quack, quack, quacko and porcupines drank fiery wines and goat ate ta goats ate tapioca and old Mother Hubbard got stuck in the cup. Look out, centipede, cried James. Look out! The centipede who had been, this is the beginning of chapter 26. The centipede, who had begun dancing wildly around the deck during the song, had suddenly gotten too close to the downward curving edge of the peach, and for three awful seconds he had stood teetering on the brink, swinging his legs fantastically in circles in an effort to stop himself from falling over backwards into space. But before anyone could reach him, down he went. Does he have any silk to catch him? No. Falling backwards into space. Oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. Let me look again. He gave a shriek of terror as he fell, and the others, rushing to the side and peering over, saw his poor long body tumbling over and over through the air, getting smaller and smaller until it was out of sight. How would have you felt if you were the centipede? That's my question for you today. How would have you felt at that moment when you slipped and you were falling down, 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 your long body with 42 legs and 42 boots, I would like you to please write about how you would have felt if you were the centipede and tell me why you would have felt that way. Also, how did you picture him in your head? How did you visualize him falling? Can you please also draw a picture or describe how you visualized it? I'll see you later. Bye-bye.